Uh, classification. So far in the course we've been doing regression and now we're doing classification. Let's see what people said. So this was all from the videos. In regression we are always using the mean squared error so far. For classification the error function we use is what? Uh, so cross entropy error is definitely related to uh, classification. I'll talk about this one in a second. This is not what I was looking at. Uh, not thinking of. Cross validation is a way to measure the error, but how, what are you measuring? So you can think of cross-validation like the toolbox you keep your meter stick in, but I'm asking you what is the meter stick? Okay, how are you gonna measure the actual difference? So cross-validation is related, but not what I want. Uh, log loss, log loss is actually the same as cross-entropy error in a certain way. Uh, misclassification error rate is what I wanted. So one person got it. The error function that we're gonna talk about today it, for classification, and this was in the videos. Um, so for regression, we did the mean squared error, right? So we did y minus y hat squared, right? We started with the dice. We said you roll a four-sided dice, you pay me dollars equal to the square of the difference between what you guessed and what it is. That was regression. And today we're doing classification, and it's just the misclassification rate. Uh, so this is sometimes called the uh, misclassification error rate, or sometimes just called accuracy. Your accuracy is, is y equal to y hat? Did you get it exactly right? And sometimes people put an indicator function. So this one means an indicator function. That's the function that is one if y equals y hat, and is zero if y is not equal to y hat. Um, why is this called accuracy? Well, normally you do the mean value. You take the expected value of this, right? That's the mean squared error. You average, uh, the true value minus what you guess squared. And if you average this, this accuracy is sort of the probability you got it right. The expected value of something that's either one or zero is the probability that y equals y hat. Um, did you get it right? Uh, I will say one more thing. This is sometimes called the top one, top one accuracy, because you only get one guess, y hat, in things that have a lot of different outcomes. So for example, if you want to label images as what's in the image, sometimes they'll let you take three guesses. They'll say, is it a cat or is it a dog or is it a fox? Um, that would be the top three accuracy. So if, it's, if the true answer is anywhere in the list of three you got, that would be the top three. We're talking about the top one accuracy because um, you only get one guess. Okay, let me clarify. So a few people wrote about the log loss and the cross entropy error. And those are related. So I'll say quickly what those are because people uh, mentioned them. In a true classification problem, you are just trying to come up with the class, y hat. So you're just trying to say, what class is this? Is this red or green or blue? But something that is somewhere in between regression and classification is you would estimate the probability. This is a different problem. This is the probability estimation problem. Probability of class. I'll call this the probability of class estimation. Estimation. Um, so in this one, in, in regression where y hat is a number, so let's, let's put y hat here is in R, some real number, like the price of the house or whatever. In classification, y hat is some element of the classes, and they use the script C to do that. So for example, it could be, is it red or green or blue? Let's go with that as our example for today. Red, green, blue. So y hat is one of the classes. But there is something in between, which is estimating the probability that it's red or green or blue. And so in the probability of estimation, y hat is a vector. It's a vector in r to the power c. And it's a vector that is positive and sums to 1. So uh, y hat of red plus y hat of blue plus y hat of green should sum to 1 and each should be between zero and one. So in, in a true classification problem, you're just trying to say, is it red or green or blue? But in the probability one, you're saying, what is the probability it's red? What is the probability it's blue? And what is the probability it's green? And these two things are related. You can, if you have a very good method for estimating the probability of classes, you can always convert it into something that is doing actual classification by doing the maximum probability. So, and this is what we talked about in the videos. You can uh, method to convert probabilities 
uh, let's say estimated probabilities to estimated class. And that's what they said is the best way to do it is you just say y hat, which class are you, is going to be the argmax. Let's, let's do argmax with a lowercase a. The argmax. That means which one is the biggest of y hat i. So i in class. So you tell me which class has the highest probability, and you output that. Um, so you, if you have a machine that can estimate probabilities very well, then you can also do classification very well. And the example of cross-entry loss or the log loss, those are both error functions, not for classification, but those are error functions for the probabilities. And so the error function here, error function here, function is equal to the cross-entropy Uh, which is the same as a certain log loss. Um, and this topic, actually, all of this stuff, this is the topic of next class. So on Thursday, we'll do this in a lot of detail. But because people mentioned it now, it's good to not get confused. In today's class, we're just going to do this. And then in next class, we're going to upgrade to doing that. Because in practice, people really do this one, and then they just classify by taking the maximum. OK, any questions or comments about the difference between this and this? Okay, and so today we're going to do one algorithm. There are some algorithms that can do classification without estimating probabilities. And those are the ones we're going to talk about today. Uh, and then we're going to spend a little time getting into this. Um, and that one algorithm is this three-letter acronym algorithm. So it's an algorithm that does classification in a very simple way. And you, it, you can think of it as not estimating the probabilities. It just, it just tells you a class. Okay, and let's see if people figure this out. Uh, so. SVM, SVM stands for Support Vector Machine. So that is an algorithm, and it does do classification. So I guess it's the correct answer to this. That is not the one that was in the videos, but that is, I think that's the technically correct answer. It's a three-letter acronym, and it does classification. Uh, is it simple? I don't know. It's, SVM is a little hard to describe. You need to know what support vectors are, and hyperplanes and things. Uh, IDK, another good three-letter acronym for I don't know. <laughs> Uh, GLM, so GLM stands for Generalized Linear Model. And a GLM is actually doing exactly one of the things we talked about. So a GLM is doing this, this, this guy. A GLM is estimating the probability of the classes by making a certain assumption about the form the probabilities take. And so a Generalized Linear Model inside a GLM is saying something about the probabilities involve a linear function somehow. And it's general because you can do any kind of length function. Um, so we're going to talk about that later. That is not the one we want. I want one that is just classification. And the correct answer that three people got from the videos is KNN. So over here, KNN. Oh, I guess I didn't put in the right answer. But KNN, half the people got it right. And KNN stands for K nearest neighbors. Uh, so that's the first one we're going to talk about. And that one really is doing just classification. So an example, KNN. And that stands for K nearest neighbors. K nearest neighbors. And this is possibly the simplest possible algorithm for doing a, a classification. And you don't have to think about estimating probabilities or anything like that. All you do is for every for every test point, test point, uh, find the k nearest neighbor nearest neighbor training point so you give me a test point I look in the training data set the data set of all the things I'm training on I find the K nearest neighbors my K is a little funny but that's, that's K and then you have them vote they vote the K nearest neighbors you can give them as making a little committee of size K people and they each vote for what they think the test point is and they vote, they always vote for what they are. So uh, use majority majority rule on these K points. And the example they gave in the textbook, so there's a very nice section in the textbook, so hopefully you guys are reading along in the textbook when it's helpful. The videos come with the textbook. Um, can I make this thing a bit smaller? Probably not. Well, okay. Uh, 
So this is the KNN approach. And so in here they have x values which are two dimensional. So this plane is showing you the two different uh, x1 and x2. And the color, either blue or orange, is telling you the y value. So there's blue points and orange points, and we want to tell them apart. And here is some test point x that we don't know the identity of. We would like to know is x a blue point or an orange point. And what we do is we find the three nearest neighbors in this example, and they vote. And in this case, there were two blues and one orange. So the blues win, and we say this x point is a blue point. And if you do that for all the possible x points, you, you cover the plane with these little votes, you will get a nice graph like this. This region was orange, or where two, at least two out of three of the points are orange, and the blues, this blue region is where at least two of the three points are blue. And this is a way to classify for any given point. You can say, is it going to be blue or orange? Uh, so there you go. Uh, you're trying to figure it out. And here is another example with k equals 10, a more complicated example. So here is x1 and x2, and here is a lot more points. This is the example they had in the videos. This purple line is telling you the true value. So they, when they generated the data, they used the purple line to generate where are the blues and where are the oranges. In real life, you can never know the purple, the purple line. But you can see that black line, which is the boundary between the blue and the orange of our classifier, is pretty close. It's working quite well. So especially in low dimensions, the k nearest neighbors classifier does really, really well. Um, okay, do they have more? Here they have more pictures. And they're showing you the difference between k equals 1 and k equals 100. If you put k equals 100, I believe they said there's 200 points total. So k equals 100 says find the nearest people, the nearest half the people. And when you do that, you end up with a very straight line. And that's because as you move around, you have such a large group of people that uh, the majority rule is hard to change. So if 100 people are voting, it's very hard to sway the vote from blue to orange, and you end up with these more straight line things. The line. The decision boundary cannot move, cannot change easily. On the other side of the equation, if you have k equals 1, that is your nearest neighbor at all. And you can see you get these little islands. Like over here, there's a lone blue by himself. And that little lone blue, he makes a little square around himself. And he says, anybody within my square will, will classify as blue because I'm the nearest neighbor. And so you have an extreme. You have something changing all over the place and all, all wonky versus something that is a line. And the best possible value is somewhere in between. We saw this idea already on the training versus the test set and overfitting versus underfitting um, for regression, and the same idea applies here. And so here is a graph they did um, showing, funnily enough, they did the value 1 over k on the x-axis. So 1 over k, they, they sort of took k and then they flipped it, right? So 1 over k equals 1, this is k equals 1, and over here, 1 over k is 0 0.01, that's k equals 100. So they put really big neighborhoods over here and really small neighborhoods over here. And you can see this is exactly the overfitting versus underfitting graph we have from regression. This is exactly the kind of thing you have to show on your project to demonstrate overfitting versus underfitting. The training error starts quite high. When k equals 100, the training error is very high. And as k decreases, you get a very low training error. In fact, it's going to be perfect when k equals 1. But the test error for some validation set has a U-shaped curve, where there's a sweet spot in between where the test error is minimized. This is sort of the right amount to do. And this is exactly like what we did in Desmos. So here is an example of the same thing in Desmos. This is exactly the same notebook as we had for regression, but now it has been modified to work with data that is ones and zeros. Okay, And the true function that generated the ones and zeros, the true probability function is this blue function. So when the blue function is very high, when the blue function is very close to 1, you're very likely to have points on the line y equals 1. And when the blue function is very low, then you're very likely to have points when y equals 0. And these blue shaded areas tell you who is more likely, 0 or 1. Okay? And just like before, you can have these windows. So you want to say, I want to estimate at this point, is this going to be a 1 or a 0? So before we were trying to estimate the y value, now we're just trying to say, is it a 1 or a 0? And what you can do is you just count all the points in this neighborhood and say, are there more 1s or more zeros? And by counting the ratio of 1s to zeros, you can estimate the probability. Um, so that's what this purple line is, and this purple dot. And you can see, again, if you make the window size too small, you have this extreme overfitting, where it's saying like, oh, over here the probability is 0, over here the probability is 1. And that's too, kind of overfitting. If you make the window too big, then you're underfitting. You sort of have these, this very flat thing that is not distinguishing very well. And if you have it in between, kind of a just right size, 
which you can check with a, a validation set, then you'll get something like this. That is looking better. Maybe I made it too big. Okay, something like that. Okay, um, let me. Um, so we're really we're estimating the proportion of ones to zeros at every point. That's the purple curve, which matches the blue curve pretty well. And then to get a classifier, you say, where is the blue curve greater than 50%? Where, where is it less than 50%? Those are these purple areas that are shaded in over here. And you can see the purple areas match the blue areas pretty well. So this is the k-nearest neighbor algorithm. Technically, this one is not the k-nearest neighbors. This is things within a, a fixed window size, whereas k-nearest neighbors, the window size is variable until you get k neighbors. So you draw a bigger or smaller window for every point until you find three neighbors um, and, and do it that way. And there's lots of fast algorithms to do this. Uh, so it's quite easy in one dimension. In higher dimensions, you can imagine it's a, quite a calculation to find the k nearest neighbors, um, but people have spent time thinking about this and have a good way to do it. Uh, are there any questions or comments so far about how k-nearest neighbors works? We're doing it pretty quickly because we did this already for regression. We spent a lot of time on it. It's the same thing, except instead of being any value, it's ones and zeros. So quite similar. OK, let me show you. This is, it was mentioned in the video, and I got excited. Uh, they did examples. They, they, in like one sentence, they said, you could use k-nearest neighbors to classify digits. So that's what I'm going to show you. Here's my little slide deck on classifying digits. Uh, and I'm using the MNIST data set. Who's heard of MNIST before? Nobody. OK, so MNIST uh, NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And they are uh, they're a government organization in the US. And they have standards for everything. So if you are, uh, say you make tea, and you're like, I want to test my teapot and see if it makes tea correctly. Then you go to NIST and you say, please send me some standard green tea. And they have like a special green tea that is like standardized to always be the same year after year. And you can test your tea. Or let's say you can say, please send me some aluminum and I'll test out the strength of my machine to make sure it's doing the thing on the aluminum. And they have everything. They have like everything in the world. And in the 80s, they came up with this data set of digits. So these are what the digits look like. Here are the digits 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, and M, somebody modified it. So it's the modified NIST data set. Maybe M stands for something else. I don't know. Um, but they had this, this database of digits that they took from people's envelopes. And they said, we're going to use this as a very standardized classification set. So if you come up with an algorithm that can classify pictures of digits, then you can test it on the NIST database. And then it's standardized. Everybody uses the same one. We can see who's doing better. So let me say a little bit before I show, tell you the results. Let me tell you these, these images. So the NIST, the MNIST data set. So these are, there's a training set. And it's 28 by 28 black and white images. Okay, 28 by 28 is like 700 and something. Uh, maybe it'll say somewhere, 700 something. I'll put approximately 700. So you can think of a picture, even though it's a picture, you can just think of it as a vector in r to the power 700. So you think of x is in r to the power 700. right? So the examples we were doing, I was showing you these examples before, like this example, uh, not this example. right? This is in r2. There's, two, there's x1 and x2. Every point is either blue or orange. We've made the problem a little bit harder. Instead of having two dimensions, x1 and x2, we have x1, x2, x3, x4, all the way up to x to the power of 700, which are the 700 pixel values of the image. Right? So, uh, so here's the, the image is something like this. And here is x1 is what color is the top left corner. And x2 is what color is the next corner over. And x3 is what color is the next thing over. So there's 700 pixels, so 700 x values. And each one tells you how bright or dark is that pixel. Very funny data set uh, to think about like that. And there are 10 classes. So the y is either uh, 0 or 1 or 2 all the way up to 9. So there's 10 classes. In the, in the textbook example, there were only two classes, blue and orange. But now there are 10 classes, the digits 0 to 9. And that's what they look like. Uh, this picture has a nice example. Here's an example of all of the digits 0 to 9. And there are many examples of zeros and nines because not everybody writes zero and nine the same way. And the question, the thing you want to do is have a, 
classification algorithm that inputs one of these pictures, a vector in R to the power 700, and outputs which digit is it. This is a very classical, uh, by now, uh, problem, classification problem. This is a very standard classification problem, especially in machine learning. Um, OK, so how are we going to do it? We're going to do the k-nearest neighbors algorithm. That's what I'm going to show you today. There's lots of ways you can do this algorithm. Um, sorry, this classification problem. But today, we're going to do k-nearest neighbors. So what we have, for any two images, we can measure the distance between the pictures by just counting how far away are the pixels from each other. So, um, and here is an example. We have the digits 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And we have the same image of a 1 that we're trying to classify. So we know these 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 in our training set. And we would like to classify this unknown digit. What digit is this? We'd like to figure out what it is. And what we do is we measure the distance between this one and all the other pictures in our training set. So how do we measure the distance? We treat them as vectors in R to the power 700. With two vectors in R to the power 700, you can subtract the things, do Pythagoras, sum of squares, find the distance. And that is what's plotted over here. That's called the L2 Euclidean distance. L2 means Pythagoras, sum of squares of the differences, x1 minus x1, x2 minus x2. Square them, add them up. That's the L2 distance. And you can see something interesting happens. So the sample digit, those are the things in our training set. The distance between the unknown digit and 0 is quite high. Between the unknown digit and 2 is quite high. These ones are still medium, but for a 1, it is the lowest. And so this digit, the unknown digit, is the closest to the digit 1 in our training set. And so we can see from this picture that we might be able to classify just based on who is the closest. So the closest thing was a 1, so we should classify it as a 1. That's what k-nearest neighbors is doing, kind of visually here. Um, what I've described so far is not k-nearest neighbors. Well, I guess it's k-nearest neighbors if 0 to 9 is your only data set. So if you only have 10 examples total, that's k-nearest neighbors. But in reality, you have like 10,000 different images. And so you can do a little bit better. So here's another, here's another example. So in the top column, they have their test images. So they have examples of unknown digits in the top row. And then this paper is about doing some funny stuff that come up with a better distance function than just the Euclidean distance. But they came up with some distance function, and this is the nearest neighbor that they found amongst their data set to the unknown image. So over here, the nearest thing they found to this one is that. The nearest thing they found to this one is that, and so on. And you can see they're doing a pretty good job. Um, they, you can also do nearest neighbors using uh, just L2 distance, which I think is this bottom row, and you can see it does worse. So by L2 distance, this, this unknown thing over here is close to this 9. But by the way they did it, this unknown thing here is close to this 4. So they found a better way to measure the distance between two images. Um, that's what they did. Uh, so by doing this thing, you can get, you know, if you know the identity of the training set, which you do, you can measure the distance. Then you can come up with a nice classification algorithm. And here is another one where they really did, they talked about the, the seven nearest neighbors algorithm. So here are the examples of some unknown digits. These digits are unknown. And here are the seven closest nearest neighbors in the training set. And the classical seven nearest neighbors algorithm will say, take a majority vote amongst these seven guys. They are going to vote for the identity of this guy. So this guy, we don't know what it is, but there were six zeros in the, in the training set and one six. So we're going to classify this guy as a zero, which again, maybe it is a six, right? Maybe somebody drew a six and they screwed up the top a little bit there. Uh, and, and I guess they also did it backwards. So there's one vote for a 6, but 6 votes for a 0, so we're going to classify it as a 0. Uh, this one is a tie. There's 3 votes for 2s, 3 votes for 8s, and 1 vote for 7. So this one we'd be like, well, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a 2, maybe it's an 8. This one is definitely a 4. All these are 4s. This one is like a split vote between 4s and 9s. We're not sure if it's a 4 or 9. Some of the nearest neighbors amongst the 7 nearest, some of them are 4s, some of them are 9s. I guess one way to break the vote is like, Whoever is closer gets the tie-breaking vote, maybe. I don't know. You can pick how you want to break the votes. And here's another one. This one, I think, is misclassified as a 7. Probably should be a 9. But all these 7s were closer to this than other 9s in the data set. So it came out as a 7. We think it's a 7, even though it probably should be a 9. And in this uh, slide deck, they are claiming that the accuracy is 95%. So you run this k-nearest neighbors algorithm. You get an accuracy of 95% of the test set, which is, again, standardized at NIST. Um, say everybody uses the same training set and the same test set, you got a 95% accuracy. 
So that top one choice, you get one pick for each one. 95% of the time you get it exactly right, 5% of the time you get it wrong. SVM, that's the support vector machine. Very fancy math, hard to explain, much harder than the seven year saver. That gets slightly better, 95.8%. So a small improvement. And humans are even a little bit better. So humans will get 97.5% accuracy. Uh, it's important to know that humans get it wrong about 2.5% of the time because uh, it sort of goes from, you know, these two look like almost the same, like they're both about 5% wrong, but actually this is quite a bit closer to that than this is to that. Uh, so 95.8 is, is a big improvement over 95.2. If you can get to 97.5, that's like the upper limit of what you can do. If you're doing better than 97.5, you're doing something superhuman, and because it's about reading like humans, you're, you're cheating or something. Uh, something's going on. Okay. Oh, this slide also has this, this distance function is written down. We're really comparing the values of the pixels. How different are the pixel values? Subtract them, square it, add it all up. That's the distance function. So that's an example of k-nearest neighbors in the wild. It's a really good algorithm for classification. Sometimes it can be a bit slow, but there are packages that speed it up by taking the space of blues and oranges and writing them down in a smart way. So if you sort of do it the naive way and say, oh, I have to do a new calculation for every test point, it can be quite slow, um, but people have sped it up quite a lot. You should think of k-nearest neighbors as the baseline algorithm. Anytime you need to run classification, what score would I get with k-nearest neighbors? Is it worth doing extra work to try to improve the score, right? And if a 95% if a accuracy is good enough for you, then maybe you just want to do k your neighbors. If you need 95.8, you need to be extra accurate. Maybe this, going from 95.2 to 95.8, maybe this saves the post office like 10,000 man hours of like people sorting mail, right? And then maybe it's worth it to do the SVM. Um, but if you just want something simple that works pretty well, the k your neighbors is a great choice. Uh, okay. What did I say everything I wanted to say about k-nearest neighbors? I did this example. I did the examples over there. I think I said everything I want to say about it. Any questions or comments about k-nearest neighbors? It's very similar to the regression problem we did before of averaging the nearby neighbors. OK. So that, that is it for pure classification problems, really. So right, we had this dichotomy of are you really doing a classification problem like k-nearest neighbors? Or are you estimating the probability and then using that probability estimate to uh, come up with the classification? So for the rest of this class and tomorrow's class, we're going to start working on these types of things. And so we're going to learn how can you estimate the probability. And one way to do it is to just treat it as a regression problem. And that literally, I mean, that's exactly what this thing was, right? If you think of this, instead of thinking of this as this is the class 1 and this is the class 0, if you just say y equals 1 and y equals 0, and you're estimating the value of y, then the things you're going to get are probabilities. So, um, and it's exactly this thing that's written here, right? Here I wanted to estimate the value of uh, y, and what am I trying to say? I think what I'm trying to say, let's do it this way. Uh, let's start a new a new page here. So for uh, for for regression, we were always trying to estimate the mean. So we were trying to find the expected value of y given some value of x. So this was the optimal classifier. If somebody told you, I'm thinking of an x value which is lowercase x, please tell me what is the mean of the y, right? That's the optimal classifier. This was the best y hat. And in classification, Let's look at a situation where y is equal to 1 if y is in class 1, uh, is let's call it c1, uh, and 0 if y is c0. And let's pretend we want to estimate the probability that uh, uh, y is in class 1. Let's look at this probability. Uh, this probability is actually an expected value. If you do a probability, that's the expected value of a random variable, which is 1 and 0. This is the same thing as the expected value. Let's call this, let's call this, uh, yeah, let me do the indicator function again of y is c1. So if you do linear regression and you're estimating the expected value of y given something, that is the same as doing the expected value of the indicator of which class you're in. And this works as long as you have two classes. 
If you have more than two classes, it gets a little more complicated, but we'll talk about that next class. So let's focus on this two-class case. So really, everything we did for regression, you can think of, we're just going to estimate the one if you're in the class, zero if you're not in the class, and estimating this expected value is the same as estimating this probability. Okay? There is one funny thing that comes up that I'm going to talk about now. Um, and that's, I'm going to do some Desmos examples here of these. I'm going to start with, uh, which one do I want to do? Let's do this one. Let's do this one to start. Okay, so here is some data of ones and zeros. And you can imagine that somebody is uh, trying to estimate the probabilities. Let me make this bigger. And let me zoom in. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here we have some ones and zeros. And you can say, okay, we're trying to estimate the ones and the zeros. You could do this k-nearest neighbor thing, but let's try to do it by the more sophisticated methods we saw of trying to estimate the probabilities as a function that is more meaningful with coefficients and things. And one option is linear regression. So you could say linear regression. Um, how do you do linear regression in Desmos? There's some secret magic you type in. What do you type in? OK, you, let's just do it this way. We're going to put in a line, and we can vary the slope and, the, and the, uh, the intercept of the line. So this is the intercept. This is the slope. And you can try to find the best slope like this. So this is linear regression for these things. And this is what, exactly what they did at the end of that video. Let me make this between 0 and 1 so I can get a little more resolution here. So I can try to find the best possible slope that minimizes the mean squared error. So here is one example of a line. And you could say, OK, these, these are estimating the probability of, of being in class 1 versus being in class 0. We're estimating the probability with this green curve. But you might notice something about this green curve. And it's really crappy at estimating probabilities because it goes above 1 and it goes below 0. So you have these regions down here where it's below 0. And you have this region up here where it's below 1. And so this is obviously something that can be improved. So you, you could take all our methods from before and just say, we're just trying to estimate a function that is 0 or 1, but forget about that. Just do a line. And it turns out that's stupid. <laughs> that's silly, because you have zeros and 1s. So your estimate should also be between 0 and 1. Um, so this is what we're going to try to improve. And we're going to start today and just think about it a bit. And next class, we're going to watch the videos and see uh, what's going on. We're going to get into it in detail. We're going to try to improve from estimating using just a straight line to using something that fits a little bit better. And this is a general, very general problem. It doesn't just apply for things like 0, 1 value things. It applies for any kind of nonlinear situation. So the example we're actually going to start with is this example. Uh, and when I say this example, I mean this example. Here's another thing where we're doing regression, but we have the same problem. And I'll tell you what that problem is, which is that uh, you have y equals ax plus c. You can slide the a and the c values around. And you can find the line of best fit. But the problem is, no matter how good you do, the line of best fit is never going to be that good. Because this relationship is fundamentally nonlinear. So we're trying to fit something that's nonlinear with a line. Of course, you can do it. You will get some answers. But it will never be great. And um, you can see that it's not great, because if you plot the residuals, the residuals always have a pattern in them. Um, so we talked about that a little bit last time. You can plot the residuals. And by the way, this is Desmos is telling you the optimal values. It should be a slope of 0 0.33. So I'm put 0 0.33. And it should be a B value of negative 0 0.39. 0 0.39. So that's the like optimal thing. But even with that, you get quite a bad fit. So the first question, before we even move to 0, 1 value things, we're going to tackle nonlinear things in general. How could we improve this? And I'll let you guys give me some ideas in here on exercise 2. What could we do to fit it? Uh, suppose you want to fit the data below. I, I guess I meant this data, this nonlinear data. How would you improve the fit? And what shape is this looking like that you could exploit in your analysis? Uh, so I will let you think about that. Put in any ideas you have. There is no wrong answer. Um, so what could you do to try to improve the model beyond just using linear? 
Uh, and I'll let you think about that for, say, two minutes, and then we'll uh, come back. Okay, 10 seconds left. Put in any guess you have. You can also put in, I don't know, if you don't have any ideas. Okay, let's take a look. All right, so some people said polynomials. Polynomials are great. Uh, this parabolic thing, okay, this is something. Uh, maximum likelihood estimation. Again, maximum likelihood estimation uh, is what gives us the mean squared error criteria. Uh, the, the reason we use the squared error comes from a maximum likelihood thing. We're going to get into that uh, next time. Um, so add a noise variable. Uh, I, I guess there's a noise variable baked in that we're trying to minimize. But a lot of people are saying use a polynomial, which is a great idea. So if you use a polynomial, what will it look like? It'll look like this. And so instead of having a line, now you have a uh, curve like this. So I used a quadratic. Um, so this fits better. Look, you have a higher R squared value. You're fitting the data better. Um, but there is something that bothers me about this. So let's let's delete uh, these. And let's look at this quadratic. I'll zoom out a bit. And does someone want to tell me something weird about this quadratic with respect to the data? There's something unsatisfactory about this quadratic to me. Yeah, I'll, I'll zoom out even more, and maybe it'll, it'll become even more apparent. It is going towards negative x-axis, whereas the data points are on positive x-axis. That's right, yeah, the data, well, some of them are negative down here, but the data is always increasing, right, in general. The bigger the x value, the bigger the y value. But then this quadratic fit all of a sudden goes down, okay? So would you trust me if I said if x equals 16, I think the... the the value is, is zero. I, I don't really trust that. So we're fitting very well. If you make sure to never ever do anything outside of this range from zero to 10, then I think it's a good fit. But let's pretend we want to extrapolate and, and go further. Then this quadratic thing is not doing so well. And, and you could try, you could try even like a cubic uh, and you get something like that. But now it has the opposite problem where I think it's going up too fast. Where before it seemed like it was slowing down but this cubic says whoop, and goes up to infinity very quickly, and I don't trust that either. So these polynomials, they are somehow the intrinsic shape of the data because it's intrinsically nonlinear. It's not a polynomial, it's not linear. Um, and they're not satisfactory. Uh, okay, do I have another one? Oh, I have a, a, a degree four for you. So, and you can fit this really well, and you'll, you know, you'll fit the training data extremely well, but outside of the training data, um, you don't generalize well outside the training data. And this is one problem with these things. So here is my idea. Uh, my idea is this stuff is nonlinear. 
Linear regression is really good for fitting stuff that is linear. If the stuff was linear, linear regression would be great. This is not linear. So before I apply the linear regression, why don't I make it linear? Why don't I make it linear? Um, so how, do I, how am I going to make it linear? Let me see if I can get the zoom right. Well, to me, this looks like, I remember from my first year of calculus class, this looks like the graph of the logarithm function. And so how do you take the logarithm function and make it linear? You apply an exponential. So here's my idea. Take the data uh, y and apply this function e to the power y. And that I'm going to call that z. Let's see what z looks like. z looks like that. Let's make them different colors so we can tell them apart. Uh, let's make the original data. Uh, OK, we'll make z a different color. We'll make z, what color should we make it? Let's make it uh, green. So the original data in red is nonlinear. But once I took e to the power of it, it looks, I mean, it's spreading out in a funny way, but it looks more linear, right? You see that, that green data is linear. And now, this green data are the z values, which are just exponentials of the y values in red. Now I can fit the best line in z space. So I can fit the best possible line in z space. That is this green line, or that black line, rather. Uh, so that's fitting the z values on a nice curve. And then I can take the slope that I get here, m and b. Uh, so let me get the slope. Let me drag this up so I can see it. Where did it go? It's y. Okay, well, let me let, let's delete some of these. We don't need these. y, 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 z. Okay, so it says slope is 1.2. 1.2, and this is negative 0.5. I'm going to put this back. So ax plus c, there I have the, the line. So this is this blue line is the best fit line for these green points, and it is pretty good because the things are kind of more linear than the red points were. It's not perfect, you know, it's still not great over there, but it is, you know, more or less linear. It has the right shape, it's going up in the right ways, and so on. And now what I can do is I can undo the exponential. So I said z equals e to the y, and now I have a line in z space that matches the z points very well. I just apply the inverse of the function e to the y, and that'll give me a nice curve. And that's this curve. So instead of ax plus c, it's the log of ax plus c. So that'll look like this. And that's a nice purple curve. And you can see we fit the data quite nicely, and it matches the things we wanted. It's going up, it slows down at the right rate, it's always increasing, it fits all this stuff. So if you have some kind of like insight into the data that I think it's increasing and I think it's increasing and it's slowing down, you can bake that in by applying a function to it and then fitting in the new space. Um, let me say what we did. And let me also give some caveats because sometimes this can go wrong. So what did we do? We had uh, data, data x, y, and then we transformed it, transform transform the data. Um, so we got x, z by z equals e to the power y. And then we fit that, fit uh, that. So what does fitting that mean? That means we found an equation uh, ax plus b minus z squared it was minimized. Minimize. So we minimize the difference ax plus b minus z squared. That's the same thing as minimizing ax plus b minus e to the y squared. So we minimized that. And then if ax plus b minus e to the y is minimized, if ax plus b is approximately z, then the log of ax plus b is approximately the log of z, which is y. So in this way, we've got a nonlinear function. The log of ax plus b is some function applied to the linear regression is the points y. Why am I telling you all this? What is the point of all this stuff? Um, ah, before I say what, what the point is, let me just make sure one thing is crystal clear, because this is the one place you can go wrong. So the thing we actually minimized was this. ax plus b minus e to the y squared. Right? We, when we ran the linear regression, we minimized that. Uh, and then I claimed, I claimed this other thing, that the log of ax plus b is approximately y. And you've got to be careful, because sometimes these are the same, and sometimes they are not quite the same. Um, and so when it works, it works great. It's totally fine. But don't get confused because you could mean this. Let me do a, a better color. The log of ax plus b minus y squared. 
right? So this is the mean squared error for the model ln of ax plus b minus y, and this is ax plus b minus e to the y. I did that thing in yellow. Don't mix it up with this thing in pink, because they are different, and they will give different answers. And sometimes this one will go wrong. Um, in particular, like if you make a small mistake in the y over here, that could be a big mistake over there, because the exponential function. So sometimes these two things can be very different. Um, but when this works, it's a nice trick. This is a kind of nonlinear regression using this ln function or this exponential function um, to do a nonlinear regression. And you can think about it. You know, we could we could have just gotten rid of everything and just said, I'm thinking of the function ln of ax plus c, and can we just tune the parameters a and c so that this purple function matches the data as well as possible. That's what we did. And why am I telling you all this? Next class, we're going to start logistic regression. And in logistic regression, we have our data, uh, which is some data like this. And instead of doing the function, we're saying the data equals ax plus c. We're going to use a function that looks like this. Um, so it's a kind of a, a weird looking function. e to the f over 1 plus e to the f, where f is ax minus b. And that function will uh, smoosh like this. And you can move it left or right. And so even though the green line is a line, this red line, which is some transformation of that line, it's the function e to the f over 1 plus e to the f, that will transform it into something that captures the 1 minus 1-ness in the right way. And by finding the best parameters a and b, you can match the data, which is either 0 or 1 value, much better than the line does. So the same way we did some tricks to turn linear regression to fit something nonlinear, we're going to do some tricks to turn linear regression into fitting zeros and ones. That's going to be a logistic regression. We're going to start that next class. It's going to involve this thing called the cross entropy loss and stuff like that um, that I mentioned, that I mentioned really early on, the cross entropy loss. Uh, but that will be all next class. OK, so we'll do that next class. I'll stop here a few minutes early. If you have some questions about the project, please come see me. I'll also have office hours from 12 to 1 if you want to meet me in my office to chat. Um, but other than that, uh, see you guys on Thursday, and uh, good luck with your project.